So an essential part of creating scalable applications is obviously testing. And clearly there are several types of tests, such as unit tests, integration tests, smoke tests, or end-to-end -end tests. And all of them basically pursue their own purpose, right? But for this specific video, we are going to specifically focus on implementing unit tests in Golang. Now in this video, I'm going to show you how we can test our code we've written before in the video about custom struct tags in Golang. But obviously don't worry, this is not a prerequisite if you want to learn how to write proper tests in Golang. So let's get straight into the actual video. Okay, let's quickly revisit the code here we've written before. So what we've got are a bunch of functions we want to unit test. And the whole purpose is that we have a custom validate struct tag, which in this case is named validate. And all it does is basically validating, for instance, the email if it is really an email. Now for that, we got like the validate function, right? We got the apply rule function. And all of these functions are not really tested at all, right? Obviously, we've tested them in production. I mean, that that's the real test, right? To get things done in production. But overall, there should be some sort of test which really tests these several functions. What is important to note that we have two functions that we actually do not want to test, right? So what it is, is basically the main function. We do not want to test this main function. And we also do not want to test the print validation result function. So we're going to ignore these two functions here. So let's just start by kind of restructuring our code right? Because by now we have 104 lines, which is really messy. So let's create a new file called, let's just say validate. And basically, we kind of now move all the functionality into this validate.go file. Now, what is important here is that we declare the package of our validate.go file to be in the main package, right? So that we don't need to import anything else in our main.go file. And what we do now is just copy everything, right? Except the main function and the printing function. And then we go to the validate.go file and just paste things in, save, and the imports should be there automatically. Obviously back in our main.go function, we can remove the imports and then things should work basically, right? Because the file exists in the same package and we do not manually import the module here. And what is important to note here is that every kind of file that ends with an underscore and then test basically notifies the go compiler or the go test command we are going to run in a minute here, basically that this is a test file and only contains unit tests, right? Or tests in this case. So let's quickly create this file and we name it validate underscore test.go. Now it is also important to note that this test file is in the same directory as the file we actually want to test, right? To not like mess things up, to have everything really structured. And if I, for instance, would create a new directory, let's just call it validate or like struct tags or tags, for instance, obviously this validate.go and validate test file will move into this directory together, right? So that we have the code, the main business logic, but also the unit tests in one kind of place. Okay, and actually we've restructured now the files basically to also exclude the main.go file from our test coverage, right? This is not entirely necessary, but I just want to demonstrate how to actually achieve this in Golang. Now a common principle on how to write unit tests generally in any language is the given when then principle. Now this is kind of a way on how to write unit tests and describes the preconditions, actions and the actual outcome. So let's just write our first unit tests, right? So let's just create a function and we've called it test and then we basically describe the function. So basically what we have for our first function could be the validate min length function. Right? So what we name this function is then test validate min length. And then as a parameter, we just want the testing.t as a pointer here in this case. Now, obviously this validate test file also needs a package. So let's say package main, and then we save and then testing is imported automatically. Now it is important to note that all sort of functions that begin with the test prefix, like this test validate min length function here, basically notifies also 
Golang that this is a unit test, right? Or this is some sort of test. So basically the testing package can be used in this case. And whenever we run go test, for instance, this function will be executed. Now, obviously we can declare all sorts of other functions in this file. So for instance, we can declare the ABC function, right? But then it is clear that this is not a unit test or any sort of test in Golang, right? Golang really requires the test prefix. And this is obviously only for the native Golang testing framework. And obviously it depends based on the testing framework you use, right? So we need the prefix, but also the parameter T in this case of the testing package. Right, and this parameter t, we can basically make use of that to kind of lock errors, right? Or to persist the state, for instance. But we're going to skip the state in this case for now. So let's just declare a tests anonymous struct here. And this should be an array of structs. And now we define the kind of struct definition here. So what we want is basically the rule, right? So the rule in this case could be min equals to two. And then we have the field, right? Which is actually the value of this struct field. So basically, for instance, if we have a quick look here in the validate thing and just copy this over, what we have here is the rule, right? Which is just min equals to two and max equals to 32. Then the field itself is the value. So the value is actually not defined here, obviously, but the value could be, for instance, Alice. Then we have the field name, which is name in this case. And also we have the want error boolean. Now this want error boolean is specifically important to basically somehow validate the unit test, right? So obviously how to write unit tests, it really depends on the function itself. But for this specific use case and for our validate functions, we can make use of this simple boolean comparison. I will show you in a minute what I actually mean here. And what we can do now in the initialization of our structs, we can kind of define the tests we actually want to unit test for the validate min length function, right? So we say, for instance, the min equals to two, this is the rule. Then we have the field reflect.value of, right? Because it has to be of type reflect.value. And then we say A, let's just do a unit test where we want an error, right? The field name is name. And then we say want error is equals to true. Now let's just copy this like two times, right? Then we say min equals to two, that is basically the same. We say min equals to two for the third unit test. Now for the second unit test, we actually do not want an error, right? So this is a true unit test, basically. So we say Alice and then name, and then obviously the want error is false. Now in here, in the third one, where min is equals to zero, we say basically no values, right? So we want no value for our struct tag field. And then we also say false in this case. So we kind of approach this function and think of possible unit tests we can reflect to get this function to have a test coverage of nearly 100%. Right, so the whole goal is here to think of use cases, how things could go wrong, basically. That's the main purpose of unit tests. And then to cover like these test cases in code, basically. Right, and what is also important to note, whenever you like expect an error or see an error in production, for instance, obviously you do want to create a unit test for that as well, so that the error does not really occur again in production, for instance, right? Right, that's pretty cool. Now, how can we actually make use of these tests? So what we can do is just create a simple for loop and we iterate over the tests. And then we actually only call the validate min length function here, right? And then we have to define the rule, field and field name. And that's why we've actually defined these three things. So in our anonymous struct there, right? So we say tt dot rule, then we have tt dot field and then tt dot field name. I think that's pretty straightforward. So we basically only call the function, right? This is not mocked. This is a real function. And what is also important is that we've applied the given when then principle. So given a specific rule, for instance, the min equals to zero, when the value is equal to zero, then we should not get an error, for instance, right? And this is the whole principle. It's basic language. 
Right, and what we could do now is basically check if the arrow is not equal to nil. Now, if the arrow is not equal to nil, right, and then if this result, so if the Boolean result out of this condition here is not equal to tt dot want error, right, then obviously we do not have the expected output. And then we print an error using the testing package. So we say t.errorf. And then what we want to log is basically maybe just the validate min length function call, right? And then the expected output, but then also the received output, right? So that we get kind of a really beautified error message that the expected output is not equal to the wanted output. And now in this case, obviously, we just want to print the error and then the want error, right? This could be more descriptive, obviously, and I highly recommend using descriptive error messages, especially for unit tests. But in general, this should be enough for now. And then we just say error, right? And then error. And that's basically it, right? We've now got our first unit test, which is really exciting. So what we can do now to run this unit test is basically go into our console and then say go test. And there we go. We now got our first passing unit test, which is really cool, right? So now let's quickly test the functionality here. So let's say maybe we do have min equals to zero, right? But we want that this is an error, right? For whatever reason, because obviously we do not have to kind of check um, empty values here. And when we now run go test, we now do have a fail test case. Right? And we do get the error is equal to nil, but the want error is equal to true. So we have the inequality there. And obviously this is locked to the console. And then maybe when you have a CI CD pipeline, it will actually fail because go test fails in this case. And this is how you can verify that your code actually works, right? So let's revert this back here. Let's just say false, right? And now we do the same thing with all the other functions, right? Now I'm going to skip this part to not really stretch this video into a massive video. But obviously you can feel free to pause the video whenever you want and just copy the code or do it on your own. Basically, I highly recommend doing it on your own because then you'll learn some things. Okay, so let's quickly do this here and I will see you actually in a few seconds. All right, so we are back with the test cases here with the unit test and let's quickly reiterate over the test cases. So we have the max length function, which we are going to test as well, right? There's nothing really important to know here. It's the same structure and the same logic as we've written before with our validate min length function. Now then we have our validate required logic, right? Here the, the structure of our struct is not kind of the same, but really similar. Now here we obviously want to check whenever this field is required, right? So we want to check the validate required function. And so we expect that these two kind of test cases in this case are basically testing the required functionality, right? So obviously for this unit test here or for this test case, we do want an error basically because the value is empty, right? But it is required. Then the test validate email function is pretty easy to understand as well. We just check if the value is a valid email. Now the apply rule function just calls the other functions. So we are not mocking anything. We are just basically testing the apply rule function and also kind of the other functions as well. Right? But the focus here is really the apply rule function. And then last but not least, we do have the test validate function, which tests the validate function, the overall validate function we use for extracting the custom struct tag, right? And basically here we test all the other functions as well. And then we also have this kind of not really necessary function here. Obviously we can remove this, but I just want to demonstrate how we can achieve 100% test coverage, right? And this is not always required. And I don't really suggest here always aiming towards the 100% test coverage, obviously, because you cannot always achieve 100% test coverage, right? So this is just an example to demonstrate here how we can achieve it, right? And this is like basically only testing for a struct which doesn't have any tags in the validate function, right? Whenever we call the validate function. Now, obviously this is a possible use case. All right, so with all these functions in mind and all these test cases, 
Let's quickly run our test cases here by running go test. And we can actually see that the test cases pass. Now to get like a more structured output, we can say go test dash V to get a verbose output, right? We actually see which function is called and then if it passed or not. Right? I think that is pretty good to know as well here. Now I've talked about test coverage, but how can we actually get the test coverage of our application here, of our Golang project? Now what we can run is just go test dash V just for the verbose logging purposes. And then we say cover profile and then let's just say cover dot out. Now what this specific command will actually do is it will create a new cover dot out file, which basically contains all the possible tested lines and not tested lines, right? That's why we only get 80.5 test coverage of our statements. Now we are going to fix this in a minute here, because obviously the main dot go file is also respected in our test coverage. But what we can do now to then see, okay, which specific line is not tested, we can just run go tool cover and then we say dash HTML is equal to cover dot out. Now, and this will now kind of create an HTML file for us, which lines are covered and which are not covered. So as you can see here, the main.go file is not covered, right? And the validate.go file is 100% covered, as you can see here. Now let's just quickly fix this issue where the main.go file is also considered for the test coverage. Now removing files from the test coverage is not always recommended, right? So if you do have really necessary functions for your applications in the main.go file, obviously these functions also have to be tested, right? But in this case, we do not really have really important functions in the main.go file. So we are going to exclude this file from our test coverage. So for that, let's quickly run the same command for cover profile and let's just call it cover.tmp for temporary dot out. Now this will generate the tmp dot out file, right, which contains the coverage of our files. And then we say cat cover dot out dot tmp and we pipe it basically using the grab dash v command. And then we say main dot go. And then we want to basically print this output into the cover.out file. Now, if we run this, we get an error. Obviously, we have to use cover.tmp.out. And if we run this, we basically do not get any output. So the command was successful. All this basically does, this command here, it kind of prints the cover.tmp.out file contents, right? And then it removes the main.go file, or it like kind of filters out the main.go descriptor here in the cover.tmp.out file. And then the output is kind of printed in the cover.out file. So when we now run go tool cover HTML cover out, we do get 100% test coverage, right? And that is, I think, pretty nice and good to know that you can actually exclude files from our test coverage. Now, I don't recommend this, as I said earlier. All right, and that was basically it. Now, hopefully this video has helped you to kind of write better unit tests in Golang. Now, clearly, as already seen in this video, these kind of structs in Golang can be used in different ways. Now, luckily, I've made a video explaining everything you need to know about Golang structs. So feel free to check out this video as well here. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely day and bye bye.